as I said today, we are we are honored to welcome Nathan Thrall and Abed Salama um, to discuss Nathan's book, A Day in the Life of Ab Abed Salama, Anatomy of a Jerusalem Tragedy. Um, uh, this is already an essential conversation, and given the devastating circumstances in Gaza, we express our gratitude for their lived experience and willingness to continue to share their story. Um, Abed Salama is a Palestinian living under Israel rule in the enclave of Anada in Greater Jerusalem. Salama's story of losing his five-year-old son, Malad, in a harrowing school bus accident provides the framework for Nathan Thrall's uh, depiction of Israel and Palestine. Somala arrived to the US to join Thrall in conversation for this book, and this is actually his last event before he travels back. Um, Nathan Thrall is the author of The Only Language, uh, The Only Language They Understand, Forcing Compromise in Israel and Palestine. His essays, reviews, and reported features have appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Guardian, The London Review of Books, The New York Review of Books, and have been translated into more than a dozen languages. Uh, he spent a decade at the International Crisis Group, where he was director of the Arab-Israeli Project and is taught at Bard College. Um, originally from California, he now lives in Jerusalem. Uh, Thrall and Somala will be joined in conversation with uh, Ishan Thoreau, a columnist on the foreign desk of the Washington Post, where he authors the Today World, Today's World View newsletter and column. Uh, in 2021, he won the Arthur Ross Media Award in Commentary, a prize administered by the American Academy of Diplomacy. He periodically teaches at um, an undergraduate seminar at Georgetown University on G digital affairs and global age. So uh, please welcome to Politics and Prose, Nathan Thrall, Abed Salama, and Ishan Thoreau. Well, thank you all. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thank you, Politics and Prose. Uh, it's lovely to see you all here tonight. Um, and it's a real honor to be in conversation with Nathan and Abed. Um, Abed, whose story I read first in 2021 when Nathan published this terrific essay in the New York Review of Books. Uh, that became the, that was the kernel of what is now a ter terrific full book um, that tells you much more about Abed's life than, 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 than in the original uh, article. And, uh, and of course, uh, Nathan is somebody who I have admired, whose analysis and work I've admired for quite some time. Uh, we've been in touch for at least more than half a decade on uh, the, the endlessly grim situation uh, in Israel and the occupied territories. And of course, we come here today fully aware of the, the depth of the tragedy unfurling before us right now. Um, a, a tragedy that, of course, has claimed thousands of lives at this point already threatens to claim many more and is spiraling uh, into the West Bank, where, which is the, the source of the story that we're going to be talking about today. And because of the scale of what's happening, Abed, it's, it's a real honor, first of all, to have not just the author, but the subject of the book in conversation. And this will be Abed's last event before he returns home because he's cutting his trip short given the circumstances of the situation. So it's a, it's a real pleasure to be able to be facilitating this conversation. Uh, the book uh, is about a day, a very harrowing, tragic day 11 years ago uh, when Abed lost his son in a bus accident outside, uh, um, outside um, uh, as his son went on a school trip. Um, I'd like to begin the conversation, Abed, with you. Could you tell us a bit about your son, Milad? In the beginning, I wanted to say I'm very happy to be here with you. This is my first time outside Palestine, especially in U.S. So I'm very happy to be here between you all. Uh, my son Milad is, uh, maybe somebody will say, because he's your son, you maybe speak about him like this, but honestly, you know, uh because in the first day when he come to 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 the life everyone loved him when he was 
in his first months, yeah. Yeah, I agree, I agree, he, not like me, I'm black. And uh, brown eyes, he was cute, like an angel. So, so he grew up with us. Uh, he, he was a lovely boy. Everyone in my family loved him so much. He, he like, when he was one, Two years old, he he was uh, like a pawn in, in the hands of all of my family. He was uh, smart, sometimes funny, tell jokes, quiet, shy. This is my boy Milad. So, because I, I didn't spend a lot of time with him, only five years, you know, it's not enough time to to be with your son, you know. But uh, I miss him, and I miss him a lot. I, all the time I feel that he is staying with me, especially when Nathan come to me and start to ask me questions about What's my life like, or <laughs> about this tragedy that happened with us? Uh, after uh, one year or, or two, two years after the accident, we, I feel also my family feel that we, we are uh, everyone around us stop talking about him and saying him's name. I don't know because they they didn't want us to be to 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 hurt us. They didn't want to hurt us by saying his name or opening anything any subject about Milad. But we don't for, we we didn't forget him uh, any time, and his memory is all the time with us. Thank you. Uh, so. Uh, it should be said that the, the tragedy that we will discuss now um, is a tragedy in Abed's life and the, the life of his family. Uh, it is also in the telling in, in Nathan's book a, a kind of illustration of the circumstances placed around Palestinian lives um, under occupation. So Abed, I'd like you to, to give us a sense of that day, of this tragedy 11 years ago. What happened in that day? You know, as a Palestinian, I don't know if everyone who here knows how the life we live there. We are lived in small places like a ghetto. Uh, Nathan maybe can tell this in English better than me. So, uh, when when your son or boy decided to go for a trip, he 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 be very very excited. So, because he's go out to see something new in his life. So, as this, Milad, is, this is a school trip. That yeah, you're a school trip. I thought. Yeah. So this uh, Milad was uh, only five years old. So the school sent us a paper to sign it uh, to allow that we are allowed to my to our son to join them in this trip. Uh, this was two day, two days before the accident. So he was very excited and said, Father, I want to go to join my uh, my friends in this trip and uh, I, want you, I want you to sign this uh, paper. So I, I, I said, okay, I will sign it. And I signed it. I signed it. But after that, I had I, I have to go to school and to pay 100 shekels for the trip. It's not time for free. So uh, the day after that, he took the paper and gave it to the teacher. Uh, I have some business in Jericho with my cousin, so I went to Jericho the day before that. And uh, in the evening, uh, my before the school shut here, 
my wife called me and she said, you didn't pay the 100 shekels for Milad. If you didn't pay it, they will, he will not join the, his friends in this, in this journey. <coughs> so I came back quickly from Jericho to Anata, quickly, and entered the school. There wasn't in the school only the teachers and the secretary and some teachers. And uh, I went to the secretary. I, I told her I want to pay for Milad. The, the hundred tickets for Milad Trebi. She said, "No, it's enough. We closed the list. He can go." So I told her, and he, Milad is very excited to go to join his friends. I want him to go. She said, "No, we can't accept that." Uh, and he, uh, we took uh, all the bus. Uh, so it's full. So I have a friend of mine. A friend of mine is. Uh, his wife is a teacher there. So I went to her and I, I begged to her to tell them to to accept Milad, you know, to say. After and then they accepted him and they registered him in the list of the trip. And the and in, in, in the night he was very excited. I told him it's okay, I everything's okay, you can join your friends to this trip. And, um, he said in the night, uh, I want to buy some stop for the trip so i took him to the host, to the supermarket and he buy you know chips and kinder chocolates some juice and he was very happy so i uh, got to sleep that night so so he is in the morning i was sleeping when his mother prepared him and sent him to the school i didn't see him in the morning that morning because I have uh, to go to Jericho to, in, to finish our job there. So, with my cousin. Uh, in the eight and a half, maybe in the morning, I received a call from my nephew. He asked me, uh, is Milad in, in the, join, join the school in, in the trip? I asked him, yes, he is with her. Why? He said, uh, I'm sorry, uncle, there was a uh, big accident happened with the bus. So I shocked. I turned uh, with my cousin. We turned our, our way from Jericho to the place of the accident. Uh, the weather at that time was very stormy and raining. And so when uh, we reached, when, when I arrived before the accident, 300, 400 meters, there was a military checkpoint. They didn't allow to us to enter with the car. So I jumped out from the car and started running to the place of the accident to see, to, to find my son. In my way up, uh, the rain was in my face all the time running, I feel tired. So a military, Israeli military jeep passed to me and I start shout at them to take me, to help me to reach there. Up there, they didn't take me, they refused to take me with them. So I continue my way up there to the hell. I didn't know, until now I didn't know how I reached there. So when uh, I was there, the only, th the only thing I saw it, it's uh, the bus on his side burn and uh, giant Lowry on the other side of the street. And many, many people there, everyone asking about his son. About So I start to ask about where's the ch children. Uh, my, I told everyone there, my son is, was in the bus, the, where, where, where are they now? Some of them said they took them uh, to Hadassah in Kerem Hospital in the middle of Jerusalem. Others said to a near uh, military base, it's not far from the accident. Others said to Ramallah government hospital. So because I didn't have uh, papers, uh, to cross the checkpoints to Jerusalem to search in Hadassah in Cairo, in Jerusalem. And of course, I can't uh, also enter the military base they didn't allow to us as the Palestinians. We have green ID. 
So I've decided to go to Ramallah Hospital in the beginning. I asked two guys, strangers, I didn't know them to take me to Ramallah Hospital. So it took more than one hour to reach there because the, the street from the way from the accident to the hospital is all the time it's there's traffic because there's a, a Kalandi checkpoint we call it Kalandi checkpoint at that in our way all the time is traffic so when I arrived to Ramallah hospital it was very many many people there mm, sounds of crying everyone searching looking for his son or I don't know media, police officers. So I went to the reception in the hospital. I asked the doctor there, I want to, I, uh, my son was in the bus who crashed, so I went to see where, where is he. When he looked, to, asked me about his name, I told him Milad. When he checked the list, he, he said, no, Milad is not in the list. There's no name, Milad named in the list. So I go out, I phone the teacher, she, uh, my friend, wife. I called her, I asked her, Milad uh, is not in the list. Where is he? She said, uh, you know, Abed, uh, Milad, maybe he's safe because he is in the second bus. In our list here in the school, Milad registered in the, other, the second bus. He's, I think he's safe. I did, from my inside, I have feeling that yeah, there is something wrong. I, I couldn't be any calm or happy to hear that. So I stayed in the entrance of the emergency in the hospital. Uh, oh, sorry, I, I asked her where's the second bus. I want to know where's my son. She said the bus is in, in way back to Anata. Maybe it took one hour to arrive. So I called my brother. He was in Anata at the time. And I, I asked him to see if, if Milad is in the bus or not. And I stay, stayed there in, in my place in Ramallah, in the entrance of the emergency entrance. So after an hour or less, bit or less, my, I received a phone call from my brother. He said, uh, I, I checked the bus. Milad is not in the bus. So I called her again. I asked her, you told me Milad is in the second bus. My brother said he's not there. He checked it now, right now. She said, I'm sorry Abit, to tell you that uh, there's a, a mistake happened. We changed uh, six boys from the list. We changed them their places from this, this bus to the other bus without changing in, in the list. So I think Milad is uh, in the bus who crashed. So at that time I start to feel, to feel. So I go back to the reception, the hospital, and I, I told them that my son Milad is in the bus, but he's not, his name is, is not in the list. What, what can I do? They told me you can search, there are many, many injured and so I started to lock room after room in the hospital. I met uh, other parents whom I know from the same, the same school and they are living in the same place. We are neighbors and asked them about him. Nobody said me and said we, we didn't meet him. We didn't see, we didn't know. You know, because in that situation, everyone is scared about his own problem is on. So I didn't find him. I searched in all the rooms of the hospital. I didn't see him. So I go back to to the reception. They uh, they said maybe they took him to to Adasenke hospital. So because I don't have a permit to go there, I called uh, uh, my cousin. He have uh, blue ID. 
I asked him to search the in the hospital. He said it's okay. Uh, and I stayed in my place, the same place, in the entrance of the emergency, uh, waiting for his phone call. He phoned me back after an hour, and he said, uh, "I'm sorry, but Milad's not in the same hospital in the in the same care." Uh, at that time, I felt that I'm not far from my son. All the time, I spent more than eight, nine hours standing in the same place at the entrance of the emergency. In the entrance of the emergency in the hospital, standing there, I gave my phones to my brother, and I couldn't speak to anyone. The media wanted to make uh, an interview with me. I refused everything. The only thing I was thinking about was Milad. So a doctor came to me after seven, eight hours, and he said, are you, I think you, are, you didn't find your son yet, because uh, now everyone and the, the, the issues is and it, everyone find his son. We have six bodies buried in the morgue. We think your son is one of them. So you have to give us blood from you to make a DNA test want to be sure that your son is one of those bodies. And also you have to call your wife and your son to, they, they also, we want also to uh, uh, take a blood from them to be sure. Uh, so I called my wife <coughs> and asked her to bring Adam with her, my youngest boy my son. After an hour, they came. I, uh, so they took uh, blood from us. When I saw my wife, this is the first time I saw her from the morning, and we keep, I talked to her in the phone only. When she called me to ask what happened, what happened, but this is my first time I saw her that day. She was shocked. Uh, she didn't cry. Uh, when I looked to Adam's face, my son, he was looking at me like he's blaming me uh, about what happened. He, I, I saw that in his eyes. He blaming me. Why do you send my son? My, my brother to the strip, you the weather was stormy, you shouldn't send him at the strip. So we gave them samples from our blood, and they told us uh, there's no uh, equipment here in Ramallah in the hospital to for these kind of tests, DNA, we have to send them to the Israelis and uh, the result you will receive the result in the morning and there is no there's no uh, you can stay here there's nothing to do here you can go home and in the morning we will call you so i took my wife and my son and we'll go back to to anata when we arrived there anata there are many many people waiting for us from our family we have a big family there we spend all the nights doing nothing, only my wife was shot, not crying at all. Uh, and uh, also I didn't have time to, to cry or to shout. I mean, many men rolls around you. And uh, in our community, the man shouldn't be crying. You should be strong. So, in the morning, we received a phone call from the hospital. They said, 
uh, sorry, we think Milad is body. Yeah, Milad is, is the one of the bodies who, who burn. Uh, you can come and take his body. So I went to the hospital with my cousins and my brother. Uh, we signed the papers there. And uh, I want, I asked them, I want to see him, his body, where is his body? They said his body is in that room, in the morgue. I've, the morgue of the room was my son's body. It was behind me, two or three meters. All the time I was standing close to my to my son's body, parent body. I told him, I asked him, I, I want to hug my, my his body. They, they didn't allow it to me because they are, say, they said that it's, it's parent, daughter. you can't see him, yeah, it's parent. Uh, so they put his body in the, in the ambulance. I wanted to join his body in, with the, in the ambulance. They didn't also allow to me. My my brother didn't allow to me. But he said, uh, "I will not let I I will not let you uh, go in to Anata back to Anata in the ambulance." So I go back with in his own car, my brother's own car. When we arrived to Anata, there were many many people waiting for us. So. They took his body out from the ambulance and entered it to the mosque and praying, praying on it. Then they took the body to the uh, cemetery. They didn't give me one minute to carry his body or to hug it or even to see it. So I. Uh, They put it in the, in the grave, huh? so they took me back. There was many, many people in a big hole near the cemetery waiting for us, sitting there. We sit there until midnight, so after that I go back to my home. I found my, my wife sitting in, where's my lad sleep, as usual with her sister. I looked to her eyes, she didn't cry. At that time, also she didn't cry. And also I didn't, I couldn't cry because her sister is there also. So I entered the bathroom and started to cry and shouting. <clears throat> then she, she came to me in the bathroom and start to make me calm. So this is the, what happened. Abed, yeah. thank you so much for sharing this, this story. And I'm so, we're all so sorry for uh, the tragedy you endured. And I want to add something, excuse me, please. Sure, yeah, sure. Maybe yeah. some people will hear. I, I decided to share my story with Nathan. And uh, in the beginning, I refused. But when I started to share in my story and start to speak about my son, I felt that he, he is not, I didn't lose him. He is the, when I started to, to talk about him, I felt that he's with us. He's not dying after these years. Because of that, and you, you shouldn't apologize to me. Um, um, when I talk about my son, I, it's uh, sad, but for me it's sad, but I, I am happy to, to, to speak about him. Um, well, thank you. Um, Nathan, do you want to pick up from there? and um, talk a bit more about the circumstances of this tragedy and what got you involved in wanting to tell it. Um, so um, I live in Jerusalem, about um, uh, two miles away from the wall that um, uh, encircles the community that uh, Abed lives in. Um, there is a 26 foot tall uh, concrete wall that encircles the town of Anatta, 
and Shuafat refugee camp. And there is a fourth wall uh, on the remaining side. Uh, that's a different kind of wall. It runs through a, a segregated road, um, Route 4370, famously called the Apartheid Road. And there's a giant wall running through that. So these four walls encircle Anatta. Um, and this inside those walls, the territory is half uh, annexed formally by Israel in 1967. So it's within municipal Jerusalem. Um, and the other half is uh, not annexed. And what you have inside this uh, walled ghetto are families with different members who have a blue ID, which is a, uh, an ID that allows them to go through the checkpoint at the top of this enclave into Jerusalem. And you have uh, other members of the same family who have green IDs who can't uh, go into Jerusalem. And this has enormous financial consequences for these families, much higher paying jobs inside Jerusalem. At one point in Abed's life, I, I tell the story of how he had a job in Jerusalem. He worked for many years for the Israeli phone company, Bezek. And he even uh, chose a marriage partner at one point in his life based on the color of her ID so that he himself could retain his job and keep working uh, at his company as Israel put in more and more restrictions to enter uh, Jerusalem for Palestinians with green IDs like Abed has. So this community is in my, it's part of my city. Um, and I drive by it um, on a weekly, sometimes daily basis. And I would hardly pay it any mind. I just see this wall, go right past it, wouldn't think about the people inside. It's about 130,000 people. They don't have a single ATM. It, it, the roads are unpaved. They, they're not even wide enough for two cars to go. At the same time, when I come and visit Abed, with 130,000 people using this main road, I jam my car up on the side, almost scraping the parked cars on the side. I roll down my window, and I pull in my mirror so that the, the bus, uh, the public bus, can pass me. Um, this is how uh, 130,000 people are living day in and day out, uh, inching along this single main artery that looks like uh, rubble, doesn't have any lanes, uh, and uh, there are virtually no municipal services. These people are paying municipal taxes to Jerusalem and half of the, the enclave. And um, even emergency services uh, will uh, not go in there without an army escort. So it's basically the police only that are coming in uh, to this area uh, to arrest people, not to actually uh, do a, other kinds of policing. Now this uh, enclave sits underneath uh, Israel's most prestigious university, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, the manicured grounds of the Hebrew University of Jerusalem overlook this walled ghetto where you see families lining up in a checkpoint every morning to pass through just to go to school or, or a job. And the point is that th this, these people lived a radically different existence from me. Uh, but they were residents of the same city, and I didn't think about them. And after this accident, I couldn't stop thinking about them. I couldn't stop thinking about how the accident was emblematic of the deep, deep neglect of these people. How the Could you talk a bit more about the specifics of why that's yes. the case? Yes. I mean... Um, what happened on the, this morning was that the um, bus was struck by a giant semi-trailer on a road on the other side of the wall in what is called Area C, the 60% of the West Bank that uh, is under full Israeli control and administration. Uh, Israeli police uh, patrol this road, give out traffic tickets on this road. Um, and. Uh, when this bus was hit, it flipped over and caught fire. And bystanders, <coughs> all of them were Palestinian, were uh, taking uh, uh, these kids off of the bus. And they themselves had a mixture of IDs, green or blue. And depending on what ID they, these bystanders had, they would race off with one or two kids in their car 
and go to the nearest hospital. So if they had a blue ID, they'd go to the superior hospitals in Jerusalem, which they could enter with their, their blue IDs. And the ones with green IDs went off in other directions, to mostly to the Ramallah hospital. And uh, by the time the first Israeli fire truck came, all the kids were gone. Um, every single one had been evacuated by these um, uh, bystanders and the, um, the first uh, Palestinian ambulance that also uh, came quite late, and um, even though it was under full Israeli jurisdiction, a Palestinian ambulance uh, did come. Um, and so I... So had an accident happened to an Israeli school bus on an Israeli-controlled road, um, or Israeli-permitted road, would, would the um, emergency services have taken so long to get there? It's hard to imagine. It's hard to imagine that that would that that would happen. Um, now there wasn't any deliberate policy to allow. It happened right in front of a checkpoint. The smoke was visible from the checkpoint. Some of the bystanders ran to the checkpoint and asked the soldiers to come and help. There were Bedouin who lived nearby, who from a cliff overlooking the uh, bus managed to find a water tank and were pouring water, but the, there were no soldiers who were doing that and the soldiers refused to come. The people who came and asked them said that they looked scared. And, um, and just in turn, in but, but the, the point is that this entire system, there is a deliberate policy of neglect of these hundreds of thousands of people. And what the book tells is the story of this day through the lives of Jews and Palestinians who live in this system and, and uh, what it actually means for something as ordinary as a car accident to take place in this specific place with this specific set of, vict uh, of victims. And, um, and so you know, the issue is not that Israelis deliberately allowed a bus to burn, but rather that it was entirely foreseeable and predictable based on a policy. And what is that, the root of that policy? Why is the wall where it is? Why are 130,000 people walled off in this way? It is that Israel has a policy of ensuring that the fewest number of Palestinians would be in Jerusalem and that they would relinquish the least amount of land while pushing as many Palestinians as possible on the other side of the heart of the city with this wall. And all, everything else flows from that. Um, and, uh, and, and so the, the, um, since the accident happened, I couldn't stop thinking about um, these families who uh, suffered through this event, this foreseeable tragedy. And th there have been others, too. You know, since years later, a couple of, several years ago, there was an event like this in an area similar on the other side of the wall called Kufarakab, also in municipal Jerusalem. Fire trucks came to the Kalandia checkpoint. They weren't allowed through. And, uh, and the just ordinary people were trying to help put out this fire and rescue people, and people died. Um, so, so this is um, this uh, bizarre and um, horrible reality that so many people who share this city with me live in. And I wanted to tell the story of this day in order to explain what it actually is to live in this place. And I very deliberately didn't want to choose something that could be exceptionalized, a major attack or um, an invasion. I didn't want a series of questions about why specifically did what preceded this particular incident. And, and what I wanted was to take something absolutely ordinary that happens all over the world and show this is, this is what the system does. This is what it's like to live through it, to be a father with a green ID, unable to find your son at a Jerusalem hospital, unable to go and actually check on him. So, so tell us a bit about the project between you two. How did you uh, set about reporting this? How did Abed, did you, did you, you said initially that you didn't really want to talk about this and your experience of this. Um, what was it like for, for both of you in, in the telling, of, in, in sort of first compiling the story and then the telling the story? Um, I, I first decided that I wanted to write about the, um, 
the accident before I met Abed. And um, while I was looking for people, um, anyone connected in any way, Jews and Palestinians, to, to the accident, um, I learned that a very close family friend, um, she told me that she had a distant relative who was a parent of uh, one of the kids who passed away. And she called a less distant relative who called Abed. And, um, and I found myself um, at his home. And um, we spent, you know, much of the last four years of our lives uh, talking together and um, grieving together. So when I received uh, a phone call from Nathan that he, he, he said, I'm a journalist, I want to write uh, about what happened with your son, that accident. Uh, I said to uh, I told him it's okay, but I want to ask my wife before. She, when I asked my wife, I told her that I'm journalist, American journalist, want to to write uh, about what happened with us in that day and our story. Uh, she refused. She said, "No, I don't want to speak about this ever." Uh, after that. You know, I, as a father who buried his son without hugging him, and, uh, and after these years, someone from far, from U.S., or I don't know, I didn't know that he was living in Jerusalem at that day, from U.S. came and want, wanted to speak about your tragedy, your son. So from inside, I decided to to, to meet him. So when he visited me in my home, uh, and when he started to ask questions about what happened with Milad, uh, a strange feeling I mean, for me as a father who didn't, I said, I didn't hug my, my son body. I think that he is digging in my heart. I, I feel that he is uh, bringing me my son back. I feel my son's spirit uh, between us. From inside, I feel happy. That is my son's story, and his name is coming back for me as a father. And when I start to speak, uh, to talk about my son, he he, uh, he asked me the same questions in every event. So I I did hear same question to me about Milad, what he he was. So I I think in the first meeting with him, as I said, he. He digged inside my heart and bring the memories of my son out. So I started to cry. And here she, he also shared me his my tears also, Nathan. Could I could I stop you there? Nathan, would you want to talk about the the tragedy that prefigured your own journey to this part of the world? Sure. Um, it's, uh, it's really coincidence, but uh, a major, there was an accident that was a major event in, in my life. It was something that I shared with Abed much, much later. Um, the, my grandparents were visiting me. I was living in Los Angeles, and uh, on, they were driving back to the Bay Area where I grew up. And, uh, and on their way, they... Um, veered off the side of a road and fell and went down an embankment and um, uh, my uh, grandmother passed away and my uh, grandfather survived. I was very close to them. They raised me as much as my own parents and um, 
And so this totally upended my, my life. I quit my job. I moved back to the Bay Area. We didn't, they were young at that time for my young grandparents and, and um, uh, just dealt with, we didn't have a, a plot in a cemetery. We didn't have anything. So I was just dealing with the consequences. And my mom uh, said to me, you know, your grandmother always wanted to go uh, to Jerusalem with you. She, that was her dream, is to go to Jerusalem with you. Um, why don't you take one of these free trips to Israel? And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, I don't know what they're called, but they're these free trips to Israel. So, um, so I took a, a birthright trip to Israel. Um, Sheldon Adelson is really the, the ultimate root cause of this, this book. Um, and uh, and yeah, I was I was hooked and um, started to 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 work on on this. We have limited time left, and forgive me. So so for those who do have questions, please start lining up there. I'd just like to you know ask you guys again. Uh, you know, obviously for us sitting here in Washington, uh, when we look at the Holy Land, at Israel, the occupied territories. Our view of it is really measured out in acts of violence, more so now than ever. Um, but what you underscore in your book is the need to have a different vision. And, and that's a vision of something equally in many ways brutal, right? The, the, the vision that I, that I say we need to, to hold in mind. Well, I mean, yeah. uh, I right. yes, yes. Um, Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the book was written out of a frustration with exactly what we're seeing now, which is um, let's look at uh, Israel-Palestine only when there's a war in Gaza, only when there's an eruption of violence. And what do we do when that happens? We call for a restoration of calm. What is the calm that we're calling for? What is the situation that we're calling for to be restored? That is the subject of this book. I wanted us to put our attention on the situation when there isn't a war in Gaza, the, a situation of deep, deep injustice, a system that is decades long where 7 million uh, Israeli Jews and 7 million Palestinians all live under Israeli control, and the vast majority of those Palestinians do not have basic civil rights. And that situation leads to all of the recurrence of this bloodshed that we see. And I wanted us to attend to that because we're not going to get anywhere by looking only at Gaza and calling for a restoration of calm. We need to call for a ceasefire now. That's undoubtedly the case, but we also need to continue to look at Israel-Palestine and to look at, as you say, in a way, a more bleak uh, reality that is the one when we're not, we're not paying attention, the reality that Abed was born into, that he's very likely to uh, die in, and um, that we are all facilitating and paying for. Thank you. Yes, sir. So I want to thank you for the courage to come here and tell your son's story. I think um, I think uh, your doing that makes it easier for us to understand your feelings and emotions of what you went through, at least partially. And it underlines our basic humanity, what we have in common, rather than what we have that's different. And too often we emphasize the differences. So thank you for doing that. Um, so my question goes to what you were just discussing. Uh, certainly the, the violence that started in Israel is in fact rippling in the area and even outside the area. I'm thinking of the six-year-old boy who was stabbed by his landlord in the US because he was different. And uh, so the tragedy just keeps rolling and the cycles of violence keep getting repeated. So my question really is, and maybe this is bad timing, but it has to go with finding hope 
in a situation that today seems very hopeless to me. So is there hope? And I'd like each of you to do a sentence or two. And there are other people that want to ask questions on what that might look like. Are the Oslo Accords dead? Do people have any hope for reviving them? What's the future look like that could be better for uh, having agency uh, being treated with respect and dignity and also allowing the state of Israel the right to exist in peace? Thank you. Uh, with, I, I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just your humble moderator. But um, I do think it's, it's a great way to bring into, into the conversation some of the other aspects of your book, um, the, the, the really human stories you're telling, the connections between Israelis and Palestinians that do exist in the book. How do you, do you, do you locate hope in the story that you told? Um, I'm, I'm not a good person to come to for hope. Um, That's why I bother you as a journalist. <laughs> um, you know, I, the last, you know, week and a half, I never felt this level of despair um, over the future of this place, the future, my future of my daughters in that place. Um, so it's very hard to have any uh, kind of uh, hope. Um, it's true that the book tells about how these people do interact with one another, even with all of the power differential and the absence of rights. There is still um, all kinds of um, human interaction that happens, and there is humanity. I mean, when I was interviewing settler paramedics and uh, settler doctors and, and social workers um, uh, and, and some of the ultra-Orthodox who came uh, to the scene of the, um, of the accident to collect, uh, collect remains, um, Abed asked me, he, he was very curious about those interviews and he wanted to know, he said, did you, did you touch their humanity? Did they, did they feel something about the kids who died? And the answer is yes. I mean, they, they, they did. I mean, they are, many of them would defend the system that they, um, um, in which they have rights and, and Palestinians don't, but, um, but there, there is a great deal of uh, human interaction in the book. One of the characters is Abed's cousin who works for the Palestinian Authority. And he has friends who are Israeli generals. And he's um, uh, unashamed about it. Uh, and Abed looks askance at what he's doing, how he's facilitating um, the continuation of, of, of this occupation. And there's a whole spectrum. But the point is that the people who live within it, and particularly Palestinians, are faced with this impossible choice in every moment of their lives. Every, every single act that they do, they have to ask themselves, am I crossing a line? Am I f helping the system? You know, you ask for a work permit, they want information. You want your um, you know, mother to go to a hospital in Israel. They'd like to work with you, but We'd like to know some things, um, and 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 those those kinds of dilemmas. You are, mean specifically being collaborators? Yeah, or or just it's more subtle than that. Sometimes it's just like we'd like to have a coffee. We'd like to have a conversation. We're going to give you your permit. Don't worry. Um, but uh, tell us a little bit about what it's life like in your town, and um, oh, what about that neighbor, and and um, and you know, and and even. Even, not on an individual level, somebody in town, one of the characters in the book, you know, his family, they came from a different part of the West Bank. They all had blue IDs. You can't get a blue ID if you didn't, you weren't born in Jerusalem and you're from, you know, the Janine area. So everybody's looking at these people and saying, what are they? Are they working with Israel? Clearly they're working with Israelis. Like, how did they get a blue ID? That's a precious commodity. And you can't get one where they're from. And so this kind of suspicion, it, it, it 
it destroys a society and it destroys, it's amazing the, the degree to which Palestinians have, have withstood that and have maintained the close uh, family and, and uh, societal ties that they have. Um, I'm very mindful for time, but Abed, do you want to, you're going back home soon. Do you want to talk just very briefly about how you feel about the current moment, given what's happening both in Gaza and now increasingly in the West Bank? Actually, when uh, when Nathan uh, told me uh, you are coming with me to U.S. and this is my first time outside Palestine, so I was very happy and excited to be here. And honestly, I want to say this is my first time that I feel there is that there is a life outside in this planet. You know? uh, this is my first time because I, I'm outside the our occupied land. So. Uh, and I want to spend, I wanted to, my, my, uh, my trip is until November 8th, I can't stay here, but, uh, what happened there is make me, uh, all the time thinking about my family, they are not on safe, I, I, the only thing I wanted now to join them, to be with them, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know, because, but because I, I lost one, a member of, of one of my family. I didn't want to lose anyone uh, either. So I want to be with them, to stay with them, to feel that they are safe. This is the thing I want, as a brother, I, I want it. Thank yeah. you. Hi, my name is Daniela. Um, I live here in DC and thank you both for coming. Abed, I'm so honored that you could make us your last stop um, and I wish your, your visit to the US wasn't as the father of a son who's gone. I wondered for both of you, Nathan, you mentioned your birthright trip and from your first interaction with Israel, you came in from a position of privilege as a Jew, a free trip that diaspora Palestinians could never have. Many of them couldn't even enter the country how did you two handle Nathan's Jewishness and privilege? Did it? Did you reveal it early on? Was it a slow coming out of the closet? Did it ever get comfortable so you could joke about it? Abed, did your friends wonder who this guy was? Yes, they did. <laughs> yeah. Many, many of them asked me, what is this guy doing with you? Why are you telling him? Uh, uh stories about your life so but uh i told him he's uh, i told him i i, I asked him and everything uh, and it's it's not secret it's my life it's my own life I, this is not secret what shall he do if he was one of those i don't know intelligent uh, yeah so <laughs> i shouldn't be scared or shy to share him every simple detail in my life and what happened with me yeah i trusted him very much yeah um, i was reminded reading the book of the uh, situation of uyghurs in western china and their system of id cards and permits and surveillance uh, all the time. And uh, it was really eye opener for me to realize that in Israel, there is exactly the same system, if not even worse, um, because of all the of all the buildings and walls. And, um, and that the places in the world, uh, Russia, uh, Western China, um, where the United States really condemns those kinds of surveillance and oppression. Yet certainly, uh, you have to write a book to talk about it uh, in Israel, and I wondered if you wanted to, if you felt any of that rage uh, as you were uh, writing this book that this is just not something that is out there, and being being condemned by uh, people that condemn it easily in other parts of the world. Uh, I'll, I'll quote the, uh, the review in the observer of the book. They said that I wrote with quiet anger. Well, listen, it's, it's a terrific book. It's beautifully written, wonderfully reported. 
Abed, it's been such an honor to have you here as the subject of the book itself. Uh, thank you all uh, for being here, and thank you so much to Politics and Pros for having Nathan and Abed. Thank you. Thank you for, thank for you, moderating. Thank you. All. Thank you.